take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of a speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. In the early days of the automobile, many companies that were successful in whatever their fields created great makes of cars. Peugeot was a good example. The family firm had been prosperous for well over a century, so when the decision was made to make cars, it was simply an extension of the already financially solid company. But let the record show that one of England's greatest cars was the last chance for a company that, without a combination of sheer genius and a whole lot of luck, would have faded into oblivion. So let's chat about a great company about to die, but saved by a car and a genius, Montague Napier. First, some background on the family business. The Grand Patriarch, David Napier, was born in 1785 in Dumberton, Scotland. His father, Robert, was a blacksmith and a good one. He was the blacksmith at the stables of the Duke of Argyles and very well respected. The whole family of Napiers were gifted engineers and many of David's siblings, nephews, and cousins founded companies, most in the business of building ships. However, Young David went in another direction, and instead of being a shipwright or blacksmith, chose to establish a company that specialized in precision machining. He left Scotland in 1808 to found a new company in London, which he accomplished the same year. The D. Napier Company began as a machining shop that offered an interesting product, steam-powered printing presses. They sold well, being bought by several newspaper publishers and even the print shop for the Houses of Parliament. By 1830, the company expanded to a larger facility as well as began offering new product lines. David was quite the stickler for precision and the reputation of his company as amongst the best manufacturers in London grew. By the middle of the century, D. Napier Company was making ammunition for the Royal Arsenal, drills, lathes, and even centrifuges for industrial applications. Steam engines were also in the offing, and many Napier machines found themselves powering factories, locomotives, and even small ships. At about the same time, his youngest son, James, joined the company and proved to be a great engineer in his own right. The company reformed as D. Napier and Son in 1867, his father retiring not long after. David passed away in 1873. Though James was a good engineer, he unfortunately was not the businessman that his father was. He decided to direct the company back into printing and stamping, and despite the corporate experience in the industry, was unable to get product consistently to the customers. He was also known to be a somewhat gruff man and had a dislike for salesmen, including his own. By the 1890s, D. Napier and Son was all but out of business. The company went from over 300 employees and millions of pounds in profits to a mere handful of people and lots of debt. James even tried to sell the company in 1895, but found no buyers. It would seem that the family business was done. Enter Montague Napier. Born in 1870 as the youngest of James's four sons, he inherited the remains of the company in 1895 after James was unable to sell it. Young Monty was, by this time, quite into bicycle racing and unlike Lance Armstrong, was an all-natural cycle racer. He also understood bicycle manufacture and began to offer machinery for their production to the industrial public. It proved successful, and within a few years, the Napier Company was back on its feet. Monty put the company truly on wheels in 1899. Here's how it came down. Due to his bike racing connections, which included Harry Lawson, he was introduced to a certain Australian fellow, Mr. Selwyn Edge. Now, Edge happened to own the race-winning Panhard and Levisor car from the 1896 Paris-Marseille-Paris, and wanted some improvements done to it. 
Monty was asked to get rid of the tiller steering, get more horsepower, improve the oiling system and whatnot. Mr. Napier just shook his head and suggested that they just start over. And they did. At first, Montague stripped the car and added his own engine, transmission and such, but within a few months it was decided to just toss the whole thing and design a true British race car from scratch, the Napier. His engine was a jewel, two or four cylinder of 8 and 16 horsepower respectively, rack and pinion steering, a three-speed pinion gear transmission driving the wheels through chains. It was the fastest car in Britain and amongst the fastest in the world. By 1903, Napier became the dominant force in British auto racing. Fast, nimble, and responsive, their cars were driven by some of the most famous drivers of the era and won dozens and dozens of races. Indeed, the very first British race cars to wear British racing green were Napier's. Napier as a company enjoyed incredible success and respect for decades. And Montague Napier was the man that took that dying company and made it rise like the Phoenix. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History, and we'll see you next week. Peace.